podcast. I'm Dr. Gordon Walker. Today we're going to talk about mushroom cultivation and mycoprotein. Pretty exciting subject. All the wonderful things we can do to grow mushrooms and eat them and even the different kinds of protein that we can get out of them. First I just want to mention that I am going to be hosting a very special mushroom foray weekend uh, June 3rd through the 5th. Uh, right now, we still have a few spots left for people who want to come for the whole weekend. This will be a really intimate experience, hanging out with me in a house. Uh, we've rented it's a beautiful house, got a hot tub, great outdoor backyard patio. We're going to be cooking up a storm, Julie and I, uh, making some really wonderful food that we're kind of customizing to the people that are attending. So we're looking for a few more uh, very special people to come join us for the weekend. And we also have a couple of spots left for the foray on Saturday, which will be about 9 a.m. to about 4 p.m. Um, and includes sort of a lecture and, and some one-on-one -on -one time with me. So anyhow, if you're interested in uh, registering for that, please email me, fastingbyfungi at gmail.com. Uh, we do need to hear from you soon if you want to participate, uh, but we would love to have you. Um, so I'm going to be kind of diving into the subject of mushroom cultivation with the understanding that I am far from any kind of world expert on this sort of thing. I have done some uh, cultivation here at home myself, a little bit in my backyard. I've grown a bunch of stuff from kits, so I have more experience than most, but there are people out there who are professional mushroom farmers, and I am not one of them. But I'm going to do my best to try to kind of cover the subject the best I can, give you some good background, give you some perspective, uh, talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you know commercial growers face, and uh, also, you know, hop into this new exciting world of the different kinds of microproteins that are emerging right now and, and talk about a few of the companies and products that are out there. So uh, first question is why cultivate mushrooms? Why grow mycoprotein? What is, what is the point of this? Uh, and my answer to that is, well, mushrooms are tasty. They taste good. That's why we cultivate them. That is why we grow them. And that is why it is worth taking the time to... Uh, put effort into making them happen. So mushrooms are, are really sort of nutritionally special foods. Um, they are full of complex polysaccharides, and that's a fancy word for good fiber. Uh, there's lots of good fiber in them. Uh, hang on, let me clean off my camera here. There we go. Uh, if you do listen to this podcast on Spotify or other platforms, I appreciate that. But if you want to actually see me in person, it's also on YouTube. Uh, Thus, it's just cleaning off my camera so y'all can see me a little bit better. Anyhow, uh, complex polysaccharides and really, really good dietary fiber. So these are things that um, sugars, complex, highly branched sugars that are broken down in our guts by specific types of bacteria. Because these are very highly linked uh, branched patterns of polysaccharides, they select for very specific types of bacteria, which help to increase the um, gut diversity, the microbiota. And a lot of those bacteria have positive health associations with reduced inflammation and uh, rates of lower heart disease and better blood sugar regulation, stuff like that. So eating mushrooms is, is really good for you from a health perspective, also because they have a lot of vitamins. There's a lot of good B vitamins, which help sort of sustain energy, again, too, with dietary fiber. Uh, it's the only non-animal source of vitamin D. So if you're a vegan or a vegetarian and you're not getting enough sun, well, Gosh darn it, you better be eating more mushrooms. Keep yourself healthy. Um, vitamin D has been shown to be one of the main things that helps our body resist getting sick, specifically uh, resistance to COVID. So eat some mushrooms. Don't get COVID. Uh, there's really good high quality protein in mushrooms. There's not as much pound for pound as you might find in like animal tissue because mushrooms aren't animal tissue, but the protein that's there is a very good match for what we need as animals. It's almost a one-to-one -one match which is very different from the majority of, of plant proteins where you end up getting too much of certain amino acids. Um, and if you eat too much soy and stuff like that, you can get weird conditions with consuming too much lysine. So eating mushrooms is, is really good quality protein, even though it's not the most, but the more mushrooms you eat, the more protein you get, the more fiber you get, that's all good. And there's also a bunch of really good micronutrients. So different uh, minerals and um, sort of the, the smaller things that you're getting out of the food. So mushrooms are, are uniquely situated as a nutritional food and sort of a powerhouse food that's really good for us. Um, they're super sustainable. They have a really low water footprint. They have a really low carbon footprint. They don't generally take up any arable lands and they're not competing with agriculture and, and farming practices. Um, you can grow them using spent plant material and other types of waste material. 
um, compost. You can use all sorts of uh, leftover products from other types of agriculture or even, you know, industry practices. Uh, there's a mushroom farm out there that uses hardwood sawdust from cabinetry places. So they are very sustainable. And that's good because most of the food we consume actually turns out to be not so sustainable. Uh, mushrooms are highly scalable, so it's easy to grow a lot of them in a fairly small space. Um, you can feed absolutely everyone with them, whether you're a vegan, vegetarian, meat eater. Mushrooms can be eaten all around. Uh, and, you know, it takes up relatively little resources in general to grow these things. So they're really good for us. They're packed nutrients, and they don't take a whole lot of effort to grow for the most part compared to, you know, raising an animal. The generation time for most mushrooms, growing them is, you know, anywhere between one to three months of colonization, and then, you know, one to two, three weeks for fruiting them out. So, you know, under ideal conditions, you can essentially get a new crop of mushrooms pretty much every month or two, um, as opposed to growing animals, which can take uh, years, potentially. So... All good reasons to cultivate mushrooms. Uh, and I'm going to start this again by preferencing I am not an expert, but I can tell, kind of tell you my thoughts on this and, and what I've seen from visiting some mushroom farms and getting in doing a little bit of home cultivation myself, seeing some cool lectures. Uh, there is no one right way to grow mushrooms. There's a lot of different ways and that's, that's a good thing. I think it gives us a lot of options and people can kind of like figure out what works for them. Uh, and there's a lot of different approaches. I'm going to try to cover as many of them as I can kind of think of. I'm sure I'll miss one or two, but this is the majority of kind of the, the basic methods that you can go about. So if you live in a house or an apartment or really anywhere and you want to grow mushrooms, the easiest thing to do is go ahead and just buy yourself a big kit from a mushroom company. So I've got a substrate block here that I got from Norspore. It's a, a Foliota uh, Namico. Um, this is a sort of slimy, cool mushroom thing that grows and is great for soups and stews. It's a little bit of an advanced mushroom because it's not quite as easy to grow as like a oyster mushroom kind of thing. But you can essentially buy these pre-colonized substrate blocks. You take it out of the box, you cut the bag open, and you mist it a couple times a day, and you will have mushrooms in a week or two. That is absolutely the easiest way to start growing mushrooms, and it's definitely what I recommend people get into as sort of the initial step is just buy yourself a mushroom kit, one of these colonized substrate blocks, and just fruit it out. And at that point, you're sort of just tending to the mushrooms. And I know people are always asking me, hey, can I like keep a mushroom as a pet? Or hey, can I take a mushroom home from nature and somehow sustain it? And the easy answer to that is no, not really. But if you want to watch a mushroom grow, if you want to feel kind of connected to the food that you're eating, getting one of these mushroom kits is a great place to start. And I, I still get mushroom kits. I still fruit out from them and I really enjoy them. Uh, the biggest thing you have to do when you're growing a mushroom kit is essentially keep an eye on the temperature and the humidity. Um, generally try to give them a little bit of airflow and you're for the most part going to get a mushroom fruiting pretty quickly. Um, and unless you let it completely dry out or you let it get absolutely baked uh, and get too hot, you're going to get mushrooms out of it. A lot of these kits will fruit one big time and then maybe like a second and third or sometimes even a fourth time, but sort of diminishing returns each time because they're uh, eating up the food that's in the block. And so if you don't feed them more, you won't get more mushrooms. You can take some of these substrate blocks that you get from companies and like bury them in your garden or sometimes put them inside of more wood chips or straw or something like that and actually get more mushrooms out of it. Uh, that's sort of a, a clonal way of continuing the mushroom culture that you have in one of these blocks. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec, but you know, it's, it's not that hard um, to do it. You will eventually get some contamination or other funky things happening. Um, but really growing a mushroom block is, is very easy. Uh, if you're on the West coast, I recommend ordering from far West fungi. If you're on the East coast, I recommend ordering from North spore if you're in Canada, I recommend ordering from JBC Mushrooms. Uh, all three of those companies I have a discount code for. It's Fast and by Fungi in all caps. If you want to find a link for those companies I mentioned, it's on my website under the Mushroom Discount tab. Uh, and I definitely recommend getting a mushroom block and just growing it out. It's a great birthday present. It's a great Christmas present. It's a it's a really fun thing to do as a family or as a you know with your kids. Uh, it's, it's just cool, and it's, it's fun to watch the mushrooms grow. And if you want to get really crazy with it, you can set up an iPhone or a camera and time-lapse your mushrooms growing and get a really cool video out of it, and I've, I've had a lot of fun doing that. So um, the other thing you can think about 
with these mushroom kits, if you want to get a little bit more advanced and you're still using the kit, but you want to do a little bit better than just trying to spray them once a day, is you can put them in sort of a container, like a plastic bag with some corner. The corners cut off is sort of the simplest way to do it, uh, but you can get yourself one of those little indoor greenhouse things and set up a humidifier inside of it. Uh, you can, that's sort of the, the tent approach. Um, you get a mono tub, essentially just a giant tub with some airflow, um, little filters on it. So there's some air going in and out and that's easier to control the humidity in one of those. Or you can get yourself one of these sort of controlled growth chambers, um, something like the Mela, or there's a product coming out from a company called Truly, um, where you'll be able to control light and uh, humidity and airflow on these mushroom blocks and, and get a more uh, prolific fruiting of mushrooms because it's better conditions for the mushrooms. So uh, I'm going to talk some about sort of the general workflow for what cultivation requires. And this is the same thing it would take to set up one of these mushroom kits or uh, colonized blocks yourself. And then I'll go into sort of like grading from the general approach to sort of medium difficulty to advanced difficulty. Uh, and this is sort of a regression that people often go through. Sometimes you'll start out by just getting one of these mushroom kits and you say, man, this is really cool. I want to do more of this. And sometimes people go all the way to becoming professional mushroom growers and start their own farm. But a lot of people don't because that can be quite a bit of work and it's a big investment and there's not necessarily a market for those mushrooms, even if you do grow them. So uh, kind of a general workflow for how growing mushrooms works in this, you know, cultivated mushroom setting. Uh, would be you get a, a mix of substrate. And so substrate can be anything from like grains to sawdust to straw. Um, I will go over at the end of this, like all of the different ways, types of substrates, how to sterilize them, stuff like this. But I'm just kind of giving you guys the, the overview here. So you get your substrate, make sure it's optimized for whatever mushroom you want to grow. You do some sort of sterilization or sanitation step to reduce the microbial bio load on your substrate. Uh, you pack it into some sort of container whether it's a jar or a bag or a egg crate, whatever you want, uh, you then inoculate it and you can be inoculating with like grain spawn or sawdust or spores or even like mycelium that you've cloned from something else. Um, you then give it time to colonize. So you get that mycelium time to grow through the substrate. Uh, and then you're usually doing that colonization step in a relatively warm um, environment. And then you move it to sort of a fruiting environment where you drop the temperature and you increase the humidity. And that is giving the mushroom uh, mycelium a signal that it should form primordia and start forming mushrooms instead of just growing mycelium through the substrate. Uh, and then as the primordia are forming into mushrooms, you need to control the temperature, the humidity, the airflow are the big ones. Sometimes you need to provide light. And then after some amount of time, whether it's like two or three days for an oyster mushroom, or maybe it's like two or three weeks for a lion's mane. Different mushrooms take different amount of time to grow and develop. Uh, you go ahead and harvest your mushrooms. And then if you're lucky, you maintain the right conditions to get another flush or two out of your uh, mushroom substrate. Uh, most commercial farms will only really do about one or two flushes at most before they kind of turn them over and start with new substrate. But if you're growing at home, you can absolutely let it go until the mycelium kind of peters out and has given you the last little bit of mushrooms that it has to give. Um, so if you want to get into sort of medium difficulty mushroom growing, um, the way to do this is to generally buy your spawn or spores from a reputable mushroom company. Again, a company like Norse Spore or Forest Fungi has pretty good spawn and spore stuff, but there's a lot of other companies out there that you can, you know, just Google, find out what you want to buy. Um, sometimes different places will have different things too. So sometimes there might be a specific type of mushroom that you want to grow that may not be available from one seller, but maybe it's available from someone else. Or maybe you can only find the spores for it. So you can take those spores and inoculate some sterilized grain spawn yourself, which you can then use to scale up and inoculate a larger area. Um, but again, that, that gets into advanced territory because you need to have some sterile technique skills to work with stuff like that. Uh, but in this medium difficulty thing, instead of just buying a kit and having it come sort of pre-colonized, we are taking our substrate um, doing some sanitation sterilization step on our substrate, inoculating it then with the spawn or spores that maybe you've purchased. And that way you're sure at least you're starting with clean um, mushroom material, mycelium. Um, so you'll usually pack that into something like a bucket 
or an egg crate or plastic bags or jars. Uh, and you go through your sanitation step, you put in your inoculum and, uh, then you give them time to colonize, um, and then fruit out. The other thing you can do is you can take a log and drill holes in a log and then pack it with either plug spawn, so little dowels that have been inoculated. And again, you can purchase these from mushroom companies. Um, or you can buy sawdust and uh, fill the holes with sawdust as well. Usually you then take some sort of wax mixture and cover up the hole um, so that other types of spores, mycelium, can't get into the log. And you give that log one or two years to really fully colonize. You want to keep it moist. Um, sometimes you keep it sort of covered up and you know moist and let that give that mycelium time to grow. And then you can go ahead and sort of shock the log. So you dunk it in water or you give it a really big you know, rainfall. Um, sometimes you can bang on it with a hammer that mimics the uh, log falling off of a tree and can actually be the thing that spurs the mycelium to go ahead and fruit. Again, lowers temperatures, higher humidity helps as well. Uh, and you can also do stuff like inoculate garden beds, which I have done myself. Um, that's sort of the cultivation that I've done outdoors is taking uh, North Spore wine cap spawn, um, Strophaeria rugosa annulata, so called the garden giants. Uh, it's a great white rot fungi that's very uh, competitive with a lot of other stuff, so you don't necessarily even have to sterilize your substrate, substrate when you do this kind of stuff. Uh, what I did was, as I was building up my garden beds this year, I, I sort of amended the soil. I went ahead and I sprinkled some wine cap uh, grain spawn over the top of my soil, and then I put my uh, straw on top. And I'm seeing already, even after less than a month, significant mycelial growth in my garden beds. Uh, it is, mycelium is essentially sort of gluing the soil and the straw together to form a nice solid layer. Uh, it's a saprobic mushroom, so it's not impacting or killing my plants in any way. And it is really working to hold a lot of moisture in the soil. So it's a white rot fungi, so it can break down all of the organic matter that's in the soil. And it's also acting sort of like a sponge to just hold on to lots of water. And that means I don't need to water my garden beds as often. The other plus of it is that as I do water my garden beds, I start getting mushrooms. So, you know, in less than a month, I already got a mushroom coming up. And I know as I continue throughout the season, I'm going to get a lot more mushrooms, maybe even more mushrooms than I can eat. As that happened last year at one point when I sort of watered my garden bed and I realized like, oh my God, the whole thing just erupted in in mushrooms. So I ate a couple, but I was just, I had to let most of them go. Um, but it's good because year after year, as you inoculate your garden beds with uh, mycelium, you're building up healthy soils. You're helping to break down the organic matter that's there and you're increasing your soil uh, microbiota diversity, which is only going to be a good thing for your soil make for sort of richer composting and turning over of carbon and nitrogen within your soil because mycelium is also helping to functionally increase the diversity of other fungi and uh, bacteria in your soil. So those are sort of like, you know, the medium difficulty ways you can take the spawn and inoculate stuff and, and grow up in whatever kind of container you want, whether it's a bucket or a crates or bags, et cetera, that I mentioned. Um, you can inoculate your logs and you can inoculate garden beds, or I've even inoculated, I have kiddie pools full of straw outside and I've inoculated that with a uh, wine cap spawn as well. And I get mushrooms out of those too. So that's sort of the medium difficulty. If When you get into advanced difficulty of cultivation, the difficult part about this is that uh, you are essentially looking to isolate your own cultures and your own mycelium. So this can take a couple of different forms. You can take a mushroom spore print and select some of those spores and inoculate them onto agar or into liquid culture and try to grow those spores up. When you're doing this, you need to have really good sterility. Uh, you need to not have a whole bunch of other microbes going on. So you may need to flip your cultures multiple times until you have sort of pure mycelium. You don't have bacteria or other yeast or fungi that are on there. Uh, if you're in liquid culture, it can be hard, but you need a microscope to check it and make sure that you've got sort of pure mycelium. Um, you can then also take those cultures and preserve them uh, either on slants, so little bits of agar in sort of a closed tube, um, which will last in the fridge for you know something like a year or two, uh, you can also make a glycerol stock where you take liquid uh, culture of mycelium and mix it with glycerol and then you can keep it in a freezer. It's usually better at like minus 20, minus 80. 
Um, but it'll store in a normal freezer too, at least for six months to a year or something like that. And you'll be able to restart your stocks um, from clean culture when you need to do that. And this is a lot of mushroom companies have slants and glycerol cultures as a way of preserving their mushroom cultures that they, they have. And so you can kind of create a little library of those things um, and then even share them with other people or potentially send them off and sell them or just share them with friends. Um, for taking those mycelium, whether it's on an agar plate, a slant, or liquid culture, and scaling it up, it's really useful to have a sterile area to work. Um, some Something with positive pressure. So the ideal thing would be like a laminar flow hood, which is pushing air out. So you're able to work in a space where you don't have anything falling down on top of you. Um, you can sort of fake it by creating a little um, Tupperware bin where you kind of cut out some holes and put some gloves in it. And there's instructions on how to kind of do this sort of thing on the internet. Um, but you can create a little positive pressure system and kind of have a mini sterile area that you're able to work with cultures and do some inoculations um, at home without having to buy like a fairly expensive flow hood or, or have the, the ducting and stuff installed for that. But it does take a fair bit of uh, microbiology experience to do that kind of culturing and move stuff around without getting contamination. You need to practice sterile techniques, so you have to have uh, something to sterilize your tools, so like a Bunsen burner or something else can like heat uh, the tip of your loop, or you have to have sort of single-use plastics that are already pre-sterilized. Um, generally having gloves, having some alcohol, some bleach, stuff like that around can really help uh, make sure that you're operating in a clean space and you're not getting contamination. Uh, because when you do get into doing your own mushroom cultures like this, there is a serious risk of getting contamination, either other fungi that are going to be competing and potentially producing mycotoxins, or worse, uh, bacteria, particularly listeria, is one that is very dangerous for mushroom cultivation. And if there's one big issue that uh, commercial mushroom farms face, it is a bloom of listeria because that can literally kill customers. Um, and so they have to test their products to make sure there's no listeria in them. But if you do have a bloom of contamination like that, it can shut down your whole facility uh, for weeks, months, even sometimes permanently if people aren't able to quickly pivot and deal with the issue. Um, but a lot of that goes back to your original sterile technique and cultures that you're growing your mushrooms from. So yeah, I mean, that is kind of the advanced end of things is, is isolating your own stuff. And, and there are people out there who are constantly sort of isolating their own mushrooms, um, keeping them on plates. And that's pretty cool, but the capacity to actually like isolate a mushroom and then get it to grow in culture and fruit is totally different. It's actually pretty easy to get morels to grow in culture, uh, but the mycelium to grow in culture, not the actual mushroom, because getting a morel mushroom to form is far more complicated uh, and has only really been worked out in China and in the Netherlands. And occasionally people get it to work at home, but getting kind of like the tic-tac-toe of all the exact conditions right is, is very difficult. And there's parts about the morel and morcella life cycle that we don't totally understand. And so it's really hard to figure out how to make it work consistently. Um, and I talked about that in some of the other podcast episodes, but cultivation, this kind of stuff is, is, is tricky. So uh, the majority of the mushrooms that we do cultivate are saprobic mushrooms. So these are things, decay mushrooms that are growing on uh, dead plant material, basically. Uh, I did talk about in the truffle episode that people have started trufferies where they're trying to inoculate trees with the ectomycorrhizal um, tuber truffle stuff. It works sort of sometimes, but again, this is probably isn't something you're going to be doing at home all that much. Um, but there are some people out there that are looking to try to like inoculate seedlings with porcini or string trails or stuff like that. It's not easy. Uh, and again, there's a lot of factors there that we don't totally understand that may help a mushroom population get established on like a new tree. So generally when we talk about mushroom cultivation, it's pretty much all saprobic mushrooms. Um, and when you get into the advanced stage too, you may be doing more than just having one little sort of mushroom block. You might have a whole room full of mushrooms. And at that point, you need to look at um, really being in control of your humidity, temperature, airflow, light, um, the safety, because having a lot of spores around like that can be a big safety issue as an inhalation uh, respiratory issue. Uh, you may also need to have like certified HEPA filters and other types of equipment to make sure it's safe 
um, to be growing that many mushrooms in one space at a time and for the people around them because I know multiple people who've worked at mushroom farms and have actually gotten sick from inhaling too many spores. So uh, when you're growing this kind of stuff, you need to be really aware of all the issues and particularly to contamination. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the choice of substrate. I'm going to cover some of the cultivated mushrooms and then I'll hop here into uh, different kinds of microprotein. So substrate, um, and this is an easy and complicated sort of subject at the same time, um, kind of ideal substrate, i.e. stuff to grow mushrooms on, is usually about 1-2% to nitrogen content. It has a, a lower pH of the neutral, so it's usually pH like 5 to 6.5. Uh, mushrooms tend to grow better on things that aren't too acidic or too basic, but just a little bit acidic uh, is good. Um, you want it to be moist and you want it to have good air exchange. So it needs to be not so dense and gluey like clay or soil. It needs to be kind of airy so the mycelium can breathe and grow through it. Um, so good choices of substrate are stuff like straw. Um, straw is generally metabolized very, very quickly. It's kind of like the potato chip for mushrooms. So they'll blaze through it. Uh, there's not a ton of lignin or any like, you know, complex sugars in there, so they can eat right through it and produce a mushroom pretty quickly. But you won't get as many mushrooms as you would if you were growing them on wood chips, which take longer to break down, but will nourish your mycelium for longer. Or you have stuff like grains that generally have pretty good nitrogen content, good fat content. So you can get a great fruiting of mushrooms off of grains and stuff like um, corn, wheat, barley, millet, I've even seen people use bird seed, although I think you get sort of more consistent results if you use a single kind of grain rather than switching up the kinds of grain. Or you can use stuff like sawdust, leftover from cabin tree, as I was talking about, is a good one. Uh, I know Far West Fungi is a company that uses sawdust and they actually let their sawdust sit around in giant piles and go through a fermentation process before they use it. So there is some sort of microbial transformation uh, where it heats up pretty hot inside and they measure that they measure the heat profile of these big piles of sawdust and they know once it's kind of gone through a heating thing and then cooled down that there's less uh, bacterial and fungal competition in there and it's been sort of fermented out and semi sterilized on its own um, they will do another sterilization step but that is one big thing that they do um, also on a commercial level when we're talking about like sort of the advanced stuff um, when people get into sanitation sterilization of things, they generally have like commercial sized autoclaves, gigantic pressure cookers essentially that will um, sanitize or sterilize large batches of stuff uh, at one time as opposed to, you know, when home growers are doing it, you usually have a big pressure cooker on your stove or other things like that. Uh, so you can grow things in wood chips. Uh, you can use logs. And again, any form of sort of wood in different shapes can you know, if a, a log is solid, it takes a mycelium to grow through it, but it will fruit for longer. Wood chips are easier for mycelium to grow through, so they'll produce mushrooms faster, but they won't last as long as a log. Um, you can use sort of random household items like leftover coffee, paper, uh, agricultural waste, um, stuff like cocoa core and vermiculite make a pretty good substrate mix. Uh, manure, you can take old manure and pasteurize it. Um, you can use wood pellets. Those kind of come pre-pasteurized. Uh, I've even seen a method uh, for growing mushrooms where it was one that it was a non-sterilization method, and they used uh, paper-based kitty litter because the little pellets of kitty litter were sort of when they were extruded as pellets, they become sterilized because they're essentially uh, shot out at high pressure and temperature, which sterilizes them. And then they used a uh, small animal feed like hamster chow as the nitrogen source. So it was a combination of kitty litter and hamster chow, and that worked great for growing oy oyster mushrooms. Uh, so you can really use any mixture of substrate you want. Uh, my friend Damon is constantly using different types of leaves and stuff from his own backyard and growing oyster mushrooms on it. So there's certain types of mushrooms that are pretty picky about their substrate. Uh, and then there's other stuff like oyster mushrooms that really don't care. You can even get oyster mushrooms to eat. Uh, leftover cooking grease. Um, there's experiments where they've been used to metabolize and grow on stuff like petroleum products, hydrocarbons. Um, they don't want to do that, but if you force them into a situation where that's the only food they have, they can adjust their genetic programming to essentially make the enzymes to make that happen. Generally, if you want to grow mushrooms to eat, though, I'd stick with just plant-based materials. Um, you could think about integrating some like used cooking grease as a way to potentially ramp up the amount of carbon that those fungi have access to, but be aware that there may be a, a weird adjustment step and you might want to have a, a mushroom strain that's already sort of pre-adapted to eating 
a substrate like that. Uh, so the different uh, oh amendments for substrates would be stuff like uh, gypsum. They throw that in there to adjust the pH. Uh, you can throw in things like rice bran or cereal meal meal to add a little bit more nitrogen to the mix. Um, urea, another way to add nitrogen easily. Um, pumice, leftover agricultural waste, like from pressing grapes or processing fruit. Um, again, different kinds of meals and agricultural byproducts. If you sanitize them, sterilize them, dump them in with your substrate mixture. Um, you can also use, you know, a corn chafer and, and leftover things. Um, so different mushroom companies have sort of different proprietary substrate mixes that they've fix, figured out for different mushroom um, varieties and learning what needs a little more, a little less nitrogen, or what needs a little bit more sort of organic matter is kind of stuff. Um, generally, as a home uh, grower, you can get away with just doing straw, wood chips, or grain. Those are three pretty consistent ones, and people know how to deal with those. Uh, ammonium sulfate, um, those are, you know, again, another thing you can add to add nitrogen and adjust, uh, adjust things in your, in your substrate mix. So some different methods for pasteurization. Um, you can do just a hot water boil. So boil something for like an hour and a half and then your straw or your chips or whatever are going to be pretty well sanitized. Uh, you can steam slash pressure cook them. So people will take grains, uh, corn, millet, etc. Soak it for a while, pack it in jars, and then pressure cook it. Uh, you can also do a sort of cold water lime thing where you like adjust the pH way up and uh, then kill everything in there, at least vastly reduce the microbial bio load. Or you can even soak it in like something like hydrogen peroxide. I don't think that's really feasible on a large scale, but at least for a small scale, you can do that. You can also just buy pre-sterilized substrate. That's an easy one. A lot of companies, including North Store Spore, sell pre-sterilized blocks. Um, you can also get, I think, like Uncle Ben's rice from the store, essentially, is this, you know, pre-sterilized grain kind of thing. So I know there's some methods for doing home cultivation of different type of, types of mushrooms where you use just bagged rice kind of thing. Um, there are some less robust ones that are less of a sterilization, more of a sanitation. Um, and that would be doing like a cold water ferment. So I've done that for my... Uh, straw when I've been doing wine cap mycelium in my garden is I don't have, I don't want to set up a boiler and boil all the straw, but I can take a kiddie pool, fill it with water and take my straw and let it soak for about three or four days. And there it undergoes a anaerobic fermentation where the bacteria um, suck up all the oxygen and basically kill most of the fungi. And then I drain the water out and I, that's at that point that water has quite a bit of nitrogen in it, so I can drain it into my garden beds. And uh, then I can inoculate with my spawn, fungal spawn, and it takes off right away. Again, that works well for like oysters and wine caps. It might not work so well for other more sensitive strains. Um, you can do tindalization, which is a really cool pasteurization method where you, um, you can do this in an oven or something else where you sort of like bring the temperature just short of boiling. Uh, and then you let it cool down and you bring it up to just about boiling like three or four days in a row. Um, and what it does is it, it's allowing things to germinate, but then as soon as you heat it up again, it kills anything that's alive. So you're kind of giving it a chance to like the, whatever spores are there to kind of get going and then kill them again and again and again. And once you've done that three or four times, you have a pretty, you know, clean slate for mushroom growth. Um, it's not 100%. It's not as good as just straight up boiling it for like two hours, but it's pretty good and it's a lot lower energy. And uh, I know my friend Damon swears by that. He just puts a bunch of like leaves and twigs and stuff in his oven for a couple days in a row, brings it up to like, you know, almost, um, I don't know, just below 212 or something like that. And then shuts it off and lets it sit there for a day or two and turns it back on and, and does that a few times. So you can look up tindalization if you're interested in that, uh, that kind of way of doing it. So, uh, most common cultivated mushroom varieties here in the United States, we pretty much grow agaricus bisporus all over the place. Uh, most of those mushrooms are grown in Lancaster County in Pennsylvania, something like 80% of the button, uh, portobello and cremini mushrooms are grown there in Pennsylvania, but there's some other places, uh, in the United States where they grow those as well. Um, those agarics are usually grown in big, flats of fermented um, chicken manure or other types of agricultural waste and they're grown in the dark. Um, they're often automated systems and they are 
they're they're fine. Uh, I I don't have any issue with the way that agaricus uh, production is done, but it, it's certainly a large scale thing. Um, majority of the other mushrooms that we think of are sort of what are known as quote unquote exotics, and I don't think they're particularly exotic, but just compared to an agaricus, they're not as exotic. Um, so agaricus is is usually growing there on something that's very similar to kind of compost, essentially um, fermented out animal you know, waste and soil, essentially, whereas all the other exotics are being grown on uh, sort of primary plant material, because a lot of these quote-unquote exotic materials are actually white rot fungi, um, occasionally brown rot fungi, that are digesting the lignin and or the cellulose in uh, in the substrate, as opposed to needing comp or pre-composted um, substrate, which is agaricus cannot process lignin or cellulose, so it needs something that's fairly broken down. Um, so some of these other things that we grow, uh, stuff like oyster mushrooms, there's a whole bunch of different kinds, pleurotus species, there's gray and white and pearl, um, there's gold, there's pink, there's the king trumpet oyster mushrooms, um, all of those are, are phenomenal edibles and they're a lot of fun to grow. Those are some of the easiest ones to start out with. Uh, people usually say oyster mushrooms are kind of like the, the weeds of the mushroom world, so they're, they're pretty easy to grow. Uh, I would swear by growing wine caps, that's another really easy one that you can start with great to put in your garden. Um, even if you don't get mushrooms out of it, it's going to help you build good soil. So there's nothing wrong with getting a bag of wine cap spawn and just kind of broadcasting it all over your garden beds. Um, there's stuff like pia, pia pino mushrooms. Those are delicious, kind of nice, um, velvety, delicious mushrooms. You can get beach mushrooms, shimeji. Um, there's chestnut and namiko, which are both foliota species. Uh, there's enoki mushrooms, which when they're grown commercially, um, they're Flemulina velateeps. It's one that grows in the wild, but when they're grown commercially, they grow them uh, in the dark under uh, high CO2. So they stretch out and you get these long white uh, fungi and sort of short, slimy orange ones. Um, there's different types of polypores they grow. So lion's mane and maitake are really good ones. Um, oh, one of the other ones that's very, very common and grown all over the world in large amounts is shiitake mushrooms. Uh, and those can be grown either on logs or on um, bag bag substrate things. The, the ones that come from China come in these sort of long cylindrical tubes, uh, but there is some shiitake production that happens here in the United States, um, happens more in like filter bags. So it's a big bag pack of substrate colonized and uh, it's got a little sort of breathable membrane. And then when the, the block is ready to fruit, they take it out and they let it fruit off the block. And there is some debate between um, Chinese shiitake and then sort of American-grown shiitake because, unfortunately, the way it works is uh, China is a monster at growing mushrooms. They grow so many more mushrooms than we do. Um, so many of the mushrooms that we end up having in the United States are actually from China. But what happens is the substrate blocks are packed in China, inoculated in China, and then shipped over to the United States. And as long as they're fruited here in the United States, you can say grown in the United States, even though everything happened in China. So in theory, it's better to try to get shiitake that are you know, packaged and grown and fruited out from the United States because it's a much lower carbon footprint. I know that Far West Fungi is one of the few producers of uh, domestically actually grown shiitake and you can be sure they're organic and you know the kinds of substrate mix they're using, um, stuff that comes from China. Um, there can be questions about the validity of, of whether or not it's organic and um, just if nothing else, the carbon footprint of moving those things across the ocean uh, means it's, it's not inherently as sustainable as something that was grown and packaged here. Um, but shiitake mushrooms are delicious and a lot of fun to grow, uh, especially if you get blocks. If you have a chance to visit Far West Fungi, you can get some of their old shiitake blocks, bring those home and, and fruit out shiitake uh, at home yourself. Uh, but there's other great edible mushrooms you can do, like uh, wood ear fungus, uh, snow fungus, the tremella and some of these jelly fungi that are pretty cool. And there's stuff like uh, chicken of the woods and morels uh, that are not as easy to, to get them to grow, but you can buy the substrate. Uh, chicken of the woods, you can plug a stump and fairly robustly get mushrooms out of it, but not every time. You can buy morel spawn. There's a high likelihood that it will not work, but gosh darn it, you can keep trying if you want to. Uh, there is more information forthcoming about morel cultivation, and I hope that soon we will have sort of figured out exactly what it takes. It does sort of seem like morels really take advantage of the soil microbiome, and so it's somewhat dependent on the different types of bacteria that are there, because morcella will far, almost farm the bacteria to get all their nitrogen from them. 
uh, and that's a big part of how they make the decision to form fruiting bodies and, and generate morels. So soil microbiome is very important when we're talking about morels. Um, so anyhow, move on from cultivation and kind of quickly go over some cool kinds of mycoprotein that exist. So this is different, somewhat distinct from mushrooms, but specifically these are fungal-based proteins. Some of them are still mycelium from mushrooms and some of them are not. Some of them are filamentous fungi. So the classic mycoprotein is the stuff called corn, Q-U-O-R-N. Uh, and it is Fusarium venatum, um, which there's a lot of toxic Fusarium, but this is a generalized, generally recognized as safe grass organism, Fusarium venatum. Uh, corn was kind of came around in 1985, so this has been around for quite a while on the market. It is uh, a filamentous fungi that is grown in what's called a giant airlift reactor, and it's essentially a gigantic metal tube bubbling uh, full of liquid culture and little pieces of this filamentous fungi floating up on the bubbles. And as they reach the top of the reactor, they start falling back down. And as long as they're small enough, they'll kind of keep in uh, circulatory motion with the bubbles. But as soon as the flock of, you know, mushroom, not mushroom stuff, but mycelium stuff, filamentous fungi gets big enough, it falls to the bottom. And there it's harvested. It goes through a heat treating step because a lot of fungi have uh, too much uracil in them. And if we ate a lot of untreated fungi uh, protein or uncooked mushrooms, we'd get gout because too much uracil can give you gout. So good, another good reason to cook your mushrooms. Uh, but they heat treat the uh, corn filamentous stuff and then they pack it together with some binders. Um, so there's a vegan version that doesn't use egg white. And I think normal corn does use egg white as a binder. Um, but they pack that stuff together, they add some flavoring, and then they put it out on the shelf as sort of a consumer product. It's okay, but it's, you know, it's been a, a good meat alternative for a long time. So corn is a great example of what mycoprotein can be. Although I do think there can be better, better alternatives that might taste a little bit better um, or have better texture. But it's really impressive that they've been doing this for, I don't know, the last like 30 years. They've been making corn for a very long time. Uh, and it's a really cool sort of bio process and just understanding how it was puzzled out and how they've been doing it is, is really interesting. Uh, there's a company called Meaty uh, based out of Colorado. And as far as I know, they're making sort of mycelium steaks. And I don't know if they're using Fresarium or something else. They wouldn't quite tell me, but I tried their product a few years ago and it was really good texture. Uh, I've seen some other similar products out on the market. So I think there's a few people now that are producing these sort of mycelium steaks or potentially filamentous fungi steaks. Um, there's a real debate as to whether or not you can call something mycelium if it's not actually a mushroom, it's a filamentous fungi. There's a difference there between what's filamentous fungi and then what's actually mushroom mycelium. I'm not going to get into it because it's a lot of semantic stuff uh, and it's mostly just businesses kind of being angry at each other that one is calling something mycelium if it's not truly mycelium. Anyhow, not my not my battle. Uh, but Meaty's making some really cool steaks. I think they're launching a consumer facing product soon, so you can keep an eye out for that. There is Prime Roots uh, down in the Bay Area, and they're using Aspergillus, the same fungi they use for making miso and sake. Uh, and they're growing like mats of Aspergillus and turning that into this kind of cool sort of bacon like product. They've also made like a ground meat product, which is pretty darn good. I had that in the last wrap, it was, it was quite tasty. Uh, also down in the Bay Area is Wild Earth. Um, they were actually on Shark Tank at one point, and I think they got funded. But they're using aspergillus to make uh, a dog food, and so dog treats, dog food. And I've seen dogs shy away from meat-based treats and go get these aspergillus fungi-based treats, which is pretty cool. We can bring a level of sustainability to dog food. Uh, there's Ecovative out of New York, and they are making a oyster mycelium bacon thing. So they're kind of growing mats of oyster mycelium and then pressing it and doing some food science on it to get, kind of give it a bacon-like flavor and texture. It's pretty cool. Uh, there's Mycotechnology out in Colorado too, and they are taking various products and fermenting them with actual mushroom mycelium, but in liquid culture, sort of big tanks. So they'll take something like textured vegetable protein, inoculate with shiitake mycelium and after a few days the uh, shiitake mycelium has transformed digested um, through its enzymes and metabolic processes uh, taken that vegetable protein and made it something actually a little bit more nutritious with better flavor and better texture and then they're using that stuff as food ingredients for a lot of these sort of plant-based burgers and things like that so i think that's all really cool 
Um, there's a lot of up and coming companies that are also doing this kind of stuff. So we're going to see more and more mycoprotein uh, coming out into popular culture. And I think that's great because we need as many different sort of non-animal based uh, options for people to have as if they want. Uh, it's not necessarily you don't have to be a vegan or vegetarian to appreciate these things. You can just say, hey, I don't necessarily need to eat a burger every night of the week. And if I do want to eat a burger, maybe it can be something a little bit more sustainable. And that's good because we're watching the price of meat skyrocket right now. We're looking at issues with water accessibility, land. And I think mycoprotein and mushroom culture is a way that we can really enhance our food security. Uh, this is very much a question of like, how do we feed the world? How do we get enough protein? Uh, how do we deal with the fact that there may be unforeseen droughts and other types of consequences that can severely impact our food supply? And having access to local mushroom farms and having access to places that are able to scale up and produce quite a bit of microprotein as necessary uh, is going to be really essential for the safety of our food future and making sure that we all have enough protein to eat. So anyhow, uh, there's my thoughts on mushroom cultivation and microprotein. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. Uh, I'll be back next week, I think, for sort of one final episode in, uh, in season one here of the Fast and by Fungi podcast. Again, if you want to learn more from me, you can check out my website, fastenbyfungi.com. If you want to sign up for the hike next weekend, uh, please email me, fastenbyfungi at gmail.com. Um, I've got some cool t-shirts, and I would always love if you guys support me by getting a little bit of merch or subscribing to my Patreon. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you guys and wishing everyone... Uh, a great week and much love. Bye-bye.